Hey everyone, and welcome to the second lecture, Theoretical Perspectives in Motor Development. Uh, the goal with this lecture for all of you would be to get a better understanding of the history and mind frame that the discipline of motor development comes from. Okay? It also gives you a better understanding of what motor development kind of is and, and how it works. Okay? So, I to kind of start off i want to share a picture of my niece and my nieces there's a few of them in here but it's it's absolutely wild how quickly we actually grow and develop motor skills in particular in the early stages of life and motor developments and and what we speak about in this class really spans the whole lifespan but what we're really um, gonna dive into in a couple of sections in this class is what happens early on. And that ultimately is where the field of motor development came from, was the early developmental stages of life for all of us. And so we can see my one niece here um, in the span of, of months, um, uh, let me just try to think. I think it was six six month intervals, nine month intervals or so. So if you think about it, from conception to birth is nine months, and and here here she is, literally a, a day or old maybe, uh, probably two days old in that photo. Then we have her here at about nine months ish, um, you know, six to nine months, uh, and going from literally doing nothing but. Uh, 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 suckling on her soother or, or, or pooping or just being a newborn, uh, all the way to almost, as you can see here, being able to feed herself, throwing a plate around, uh, engaging with her siblings, to another six to nine months. So I think this is closer to about a, a year, year and a half. Um, she's up walking around, blowing bubbles. Um, yeah, and, and just being, a, being a, a toddler. So it's pretty wild and, and phenomenal how we as humans go through these stages. And really what the theoretical perspectives of motor development try to do is explain why, how, um, and, 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 and give a framework for us to try to understand this process. So theories help frame and describe the world around us in accordance to that paradigm, uh, allowing us to make predictions to be made about what out outcomes regarding that specific concept, principle, or situation is. So that's just giving an idea of, of what theories are and what their usefulness are. I know sometimes students uh, hear that we're learning theories or we start going through theories and it's kind of like, well, why? You know, it's why do we need to know all of these just like conceptual ideas? Um, I want to be very practical and, and applicable with what I have. And ultimately, these are, you know, um, we come up with theories about everything in life. That's just what our brains are. They're prediction machines. And so the way um, theories work is, yeah, it provides us that, that framework in words. And we're able to, from there, predict outcomes based off of those um, uh, theories and prescribed uh, frameworks for, for the world around us. Okay. So for motor development theories, we have three main ones and there's some subheadings in each. Okay, so the maturational perspective, you know, we'll see is very uh, biological based uh, and really focused on that. And then we get into a couple others where there's information processing, which is a bit more uh, cognitive based, and then our ecological perspectives, a lot of which uh, pulls from, from Newell's model, which is what you learned about in, in the last lecture. Okay. So maturational perspective, that really looks at the genetics uh, driving our biology and and this perspective really really came out of twin studies okay so uh, back in the 1930s and you don't need to know specific dates but uh, it just kind of helps frame a timeline for you how we developed our understanding of motor development so in the 30s we we had a couple of researchers say okay well if you look at at um, two twins you know, we're going to do put them in two different environments. One is very um, 
motivate and engaging you know really uh, get them working doing like motor skills such as like leg kicks and and resistance with arms uh, while you're trying to get build up strength in their bodies and stuff and then we'll we'll just see who who learns to walk better sooner um, and and who has the better motor capacity you know a few a few years down the road and so they did a number of different studies like this and from those studies they found well hey everyone kind of learned to walk all, all the sets of twins um, regardless of whether they're in an enriched environment for motor learning and development or wh whether they weren't and so based off of this came this maturational perspective okay so they're saying they're innate pro processes and a lot of it is driven by our central nervous system according to this perspective so as the brain develops as we we gain more and more capacity mentally and cognitively we're able to move more and again there's some evidence for this uh, perspective and, and again largely from twin studies okay. so it's it's the classic nature versus nurture argument in health and healthcare and and biology right we come across this all the time in in concepts and so just to reiterate it one more time maturational perspective is largely genetic so they're saying you you inherit your your capacity for motor development and that that's it your biology your your genetics drives and dictates how you're going to move later in life and and develop to movement so your environment has little influence okay and one of the arguments for this is is there's relatively set timing for when we develop uh, certain motor characteristics uh, or qualities like being able to walk generally happens somewhere between uh, 12 and 18 months so uh, yeah uh, the one I would say short sight to this perspective is they it claims that uh, development ends in adulthood okay so it says as soon as you fully grow up you know your um, you reach full mental mental cognitive processing uh, capacity which is roughly around 26, 24, 26, that's when the brain stops developing. Um, that's when you're done developing altogether. And so sometimes that even ends depending on who, which researcher in this perspective you're talking with. Sometimes they'll even end it after puberty. So once you've physically stopped growing, that's when you've reached your, your end point of motor development. Okay. And so out of this field, so it's kind of like a tree, out of this perspective, this mindset that everyone hits certain capacities at certain times, biologically speaking, comes something called normative descriptive period. And so a lot of this, a lot of you have experienced this through like high school uh, gym tests, right? So you have the standardized norm, so something like a bell curve, which means the majority of people, 60 uh, eight percent of people will will come around this standardized norm, um, and and so you can measure large groups of people based off of these standardized norms. So for for example, sit up test, you know, at a certain age you should be able to perform a certain number of of sit ups, and they study this and they say, okay, all of you do sit ups, and they say, okay, well here's here's the average, you know, 30% uh, of you went under this average, 34% went above, and that's our standardized norm. And then everything outside of that is just different deviations from that mean, okay? And so that's how you get a scoring process. And, and so for maturationists, the people of this perspective, um, they're really focused on the outcomes that you can produce at different ages, okay? How many sit-ups, push-ups, or walking, crawling, that sort of thing. Another component that grew out of this period was the biomechanical descriptive period. So again, this is still within the maturational perspective. And so they're saying more or less, and, and we'll, we'll look at this, um, you know, you should be able to see very mechanical produced outcomes of movements by certain ages. And this happens in a very finite sequential order. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, next unit, we're going to like really dive into this. We spend the whole unit just focusing at how to look at different uh, mechanical sequences and determine what age of or stage of development they're at. But ultimately, the, the short 
uh, version of this is they're not worried about the process. They just want to see where the outcome is. So for example, if we're looking, and this was our, our researcher, uh, Glassau, uh, working in the lab as she was developing this, this um, perspective uh, in the 60s and 70s. But uh, she'd essentially look at uh, children doing different tasks and be like, okay, while well, you're throwing with uh, the same arm and same leg at the same time, that's not full development yet, so we're going to put you at a stage two and kind of sort it through that, okay? So it's descriptive, outcome focused, and related to age. And again, it's not dependent, but related. So again, this is where we kind of get uh, things like motor milestones, which say by a certain age, you should be performing a certain motor activity. Okay, so it's very, and, and crawling needs to happen before uh, walking and walking needs to happen before running. So that's what I mean by sequential. Okay. Great. So those are the areas or thoughts or perspectives that came out of the 30s, very biological and genetically based heavy perspective. Okay. Then we started getting into uh, 70s, 80s, and this idea or this uh, uh, new shift in, in paradigm came out where we said, wait, 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 the brain, it controls everything. So movement must work like a computer. Our brains are like computers. You know, they, they come up with these, these instructions and then they tell our body to do things. Um, and so that's where this perspective of information pr processing perspective came up. Okay. So again, Schmidt and Lee based this off of, of our brain working like a computer. So we get sensory input some sort of visual uh, uh, stimuli. Let's say there's a baseball flying towards you, towards your face. And so you have this perceptual schema. So you perceive that the ball is there. You, you perceive that it's coming towards you. And that in turn creates a motor uh, plan or schema to be produced to cause an action. And then you get your output, which is trying to dodge where the ball is flying towards your face, right? So, so we have this input, we process it, we have an output movement, okay? And, and whenever we're talking about that, we call schemes, or schemas, sorry. And schemas are just plans or framework that we have kind of pre, preset, pre-programmed uh, in our brain. Now, if you've been in, in psych, early uh, introductory psychology, you probably come across the, the um, idea of cognitive schemas. So that's a, a lot of where our biases and judgments and, and um, cognitive frameworks for how we view the wor world comes from is, is schemas. Okay. Now there's one issue with this uh, in the sense that we essentially have one processor to, to go about determining movement. So let's pause and consider that for a minute. So what this perspective says is if you um, if you're getting input you have one processing system for it to go through before you give output but what happens if you're trying to do two or more things at once well we know we can it just gets really challenging that's a bit based off of our attention but that attention to multiple things can still only be processed by one pathway according to this um, this perspective. So that's that's a little bit of a downfall on 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 this uh, perspective. The last thing that ties into a little bit of the previous um, uh, perspective, biologically speaking, is they both tend to say, you know, um, based off of the the development of the the central nervous system or the brain will in turn uh, dictate how, how well we, we can move, okay? So there's a little bit of a tie-in between the two perspectives there, but, um, but it's more to do with how we perceive the world, world and how we can think about it, okay? So yeah, so that's information processing. Again, think information processing is like computer, computer programming, okay? So our third kind of perspective that's evolved out, out of those afterwards, you know, a bit more late 90s-ish, 
Um, it it kind of started in the 80s, but um, everyone was, uh, the hot topic was computers. So everyone really resonated with the information processing perspective. But with the ecological perspective, it says movement is an interrelationship between the environment, the individual, and the task. Hopefully that should almost start to sound familiar already as Newell's model. So it's a really good example of that. But again, when you think of ecology in a biological aspect, if you think of an ecological biome, we're talking about many organisms interacting in a huge environment, right? So eco ecology is, is a large environment, a big, big picture sort of thing. So here's Newell's model again. Um, again, late 80s, 90s is really um, when it started picking up a little momentum and largely now into um, the this millennia. But the great thing about ecological perspectives is <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I'm building up some suspense there for you. Uh, is that it considers uh, the development of our motor systems due to multiple factors. So not just our central nervous system, right? As we spoke about last class, uh, it's the individual constraints. So yeah, our biology, but it's also things like the task we're trying to do um, and, and the environment around us. Right. And it also takes an approach that, you know, our, our development isn't just done once we're done physiologically maturing. We can still develop our motor skills or there's changes to them for better or worse that occur as we get older. Right. So the it accounts for the decline that occurs after we phys physiologically develop as well. So that's a big, big ticket item there is, uh, for this uh, approach in this uh, mindset. The last one is that movement self-organizes. Okay, so this is a big step up relative to the last perspective of information processing. So it takes a look at movement and says, it's not just one system that we, we physiologically develop, for example, our central nervous system, uh, that allows us to move. You know, there's a lot of things you gotta consider. What about our muscular system, our skeletal system? hormonal to develop muscle or to that might affect our, our mood state. Um, so yeah, it, it just says that there's a lot of physiological and environmental factors that come into play that dictate how we move. And I got a really good example uh, uh, of a kiddo playing through or moving through different uh, terrain and, and like a playground and stuff at the end of this lecture. So try to keep in mind the idea that the environment and the individual and the task all interact to create unique movement. Okay. And a lot of this comes out of what's called the dynamic or dynamical um, systems approach. And I have a great fun at home activity you can do right now uh, to help demonstrate this. So Again, working on a previous premise that if the information processing perspective is correct. So if we were to say things are motor programs, what we're really saying is any movement we produce by necessity must be programmed and come from our brain. So for example, if I wanna wave my finger, my brain is telling my finger to do this. Okay, absolutely, I'm programming it to do that, okay. Well, let's try this. So let's see what happens when we have two of our fingers going left to right. And again, do this at home. It's pretty fun. Okay. And all we're going to do is just keep speeding up. We're just going to keep going faster and faster and faster. Okay. So faster, 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 faster. Okay. All of a sudden you get to this point where you're just sitting here uncoordinatedly wagging your fingers in the air. Okay. So what did that just prove? Well, I didn't make a motor program for my fingers to go out of order, go out of time. This one I noticed even was going forward sometimes. I didn't program my, my fingers to do that. I didn't execute that program. So why did they do that? Well, according to the dynamical systems approach and our ecological approach and Newell's, what's really happening there is our fingers are just 
a, generating a movement based off of the task and who we are. So based off of my capacity to move my fingers quickly and keep them coordinated or not coordinated, this, this erratic movement came up, okay? So that's a dynamic systems approach. And so it says it's spontaneously self-organizing. This is for all movement. And ultimately, you know, interacting in constraints, the more we practice certain constraints, the more we can reproduce very similar actions and movements. You can think of sport and how regularly really proficient um, athletes can execute very similar movement um, patterns. But it, say, it says there's no hardwired uh, plan. So we just get really good at reproducing a very similar but spontaneous and self-organizing movement. Okay, So within this, when we're developing through life, so we're kind of shifting gear perspective. So not, not big picture dynamic, but more specifically now with, with um, kiddos and motor development, we come across rate limiters and rate controllers. And that dictates how we can spontaneously self-organize movements, right? Because we don't just uh, come out of the womb as an infant or a newborn and just spontaneously be able to walk, right? So some of these things, for example, a rate limiter is an individual constraint. So again, we hear constraints again, which can help or hinder. Um, so it's a constraint of the individual or system that delays the emergence of a motor skill due to developing um, uh, more slowly. I'll, I'll give an example after this. A rate controller is something, so it's an individual constraint or system that changes quicker as we age. And that can be positive or negative, okay? That can help us um, develop skills quicker or it can help us lose some skills or capacity, okay? A good example is walking. So as far as a rate limiter, we might have different systems or capacities in our body that de develop at different stages. So, for example, potentially a uh, toddler could have enough um, uh, strength, let's say muscular strength, to be able to walk. They've been crawling tons, they have lots of leg strength, etc. But the system that's holding them back is, is balance. Okay? So they don't have that capacity to coordinate or balance yet. So what happens is the balance holds the everything, the capacity to walk back, even though the strength might be there. So they can't walk yet until they get that balance and then they can walk, okay? A rate controller, it's easier to think of that on the opposite end of, of uh, our development spectrum. So let's say um, an older individual is slowly starting to lose their capacity to, to coordinate. So their coordination and their, their perceptual motor, uh, visual skills, their, their proprioception, which is their capacity to feel their own balance and where they are in space, that all starts to decline. They still might have the strength to be able to walk, but that coordination drops. So as a rate controller, they actually lose, start losing the capacity to walk well or, or with good, good skill, okay? So that's um, uh, a comparison between a rate limiter and rate controller. So if we were to graph this out, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, I usually like something with different colors going on, but I think you'll be able to see this at home. So if we have four systems here over time and we combine all of those, ultimately the lowest point out of all the systems is, is where we're, we're able to actually produce action and movement. Okay, so for example, we see system one, the whole the whole time, let's say it's just this straight line right here, okay? So it'd be a straight line all the way here. But because we have system two, three, and four that are lower systems than that point where this is at, we can't quite yet produce a movement up here yet. So again, let's say this is strength, we have muscular strength, okay? But this one is, um, uh, capacity to balance and this one is visual perception and this one is, represents uh, motivation to want to be able to uh, move and follow things okay so it always follows the lowest point so all three of these systems all start here but as soon as you get systems that uh, can start 
getting a little bit higher, we see that it adds and allows the capacity to build until ultimately we have a straight plateau at the top of all of these three systems and we can reach the peak, okay? And we can continue producing movement that way, okay? So that's that, uh, a bit of an understanding of how those interact, okay? Okay, again, injury, age, lifestyle, all of these things act as rate controllers. So I, I, I mentioned that a rate controller can positively or negatively help. Um, and a good example, you know, when you think about this, these are some masters athletes. So masters events typically are, are again, it depends on the sport and the category, but you usually assume 50 plus, 50 years older or older. And normally, again, as people age, we picture decline, but that doesn't necessarily happen if a rate controller, for example, is managed or, or even attenuated or improved on, for example, muscular strength speed all of these things can keep being built on as we age but it just depends so again in this situation you know uh, strength would be a rate controller that allows these individuals to continue um, a, a more active and healthy lifestyle whereas people that didn't engage in in a lifestyle that promoted physical activity and health wouldn't okay so, so this, uh, the dynamic systems approach is one, the perception action approach is another. We're gonna focus on this uh, with its own lecture later, but uh, essentially it's saying, in order to perceive something, you have to perceive something before you can act on it, okay? So again, you need some capacity to see something, perceive it, and then be able to engage in it. And this is a really big, uh, concept or approach that allows um, uh, allows us to understand why we start moving in the first place. So a big thing behind motivating children, in, in particular babies, when you're in, uh, say, pediatric physiotherapy, is you want to be able to uh, motivate them to do the exercises you want them to do. You can't just ask uh, um, a, a baby to like start doing jumping jacks, right? It doesn't work. So you have to make sure they can perceive something to try to use that to get them to move towards it, to get them to, to act. Similarly, there's a correlation between younger siblings starting to walk sooner. And a lot of this is as they start perceiving their siblings, say, moving around quicker than they are, they perceive it and they can mirror it and then they can um, act that way sooner. So, yeah, so that's um, uh, uh, perception action and how those two things are tied in together. You need to perceive the environment before you can move in the environment. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, and the nice thing about this and the dynamic systems approach is you, if you have real-time perception, it doesn't demand complicated calculations. So what does that mean? Well, if you think back to the information processing, that's like a computer, that's like a program. So that states that you have to compute everything before you act, right? But, you know, there's some really quick changes and reactions to different movements, especially if you think about a fast-paced sport where if you had to stop and calculate every single movement before producing it, it doesn't really make sense that that's the way that that movement produce, is produced. So real-time perception happens in real time. We react and respond to that in real time. Okay. Um, right, so uh, one thing that we want to be able to do, and a concept kind of was introduced here, so the environment around us affords us to do things right so if there's something that we're not able to do because of our environment so for example this child has a giant tennis racket and ball not going to be able to use that very well it doesn't really afford the child the capacity to play tennis we can do things called body scaling okay so we can change the scale or or environment to be able to allow people to perform certain activities. And one of them, for example, is being able to um, use a light switch if you're in a wheelchair, okay? A lot lower down, 
um, sometimes light switches and other uh, things around the home are quite high, right? So it's, it's scaled to allow the structural constraint to allow the performer to do it. Okay. Great. So we have, um, how much am I going to show here? This is just kind of a, a um, way to perceive how and why we as humans may or may not have um, uh, information processing uh, components completely. Just kind of like a little little demonstration. Um, if you haven't seen any of this though, it is quite impressive how much movement can occur through through um, like a computing perspective. And yeah, anyway, even in the academic research, uh, it's not really 100% one way or the other. Uh, I tend to find that most of these theories and frameworks work in tandem or some combination or in some instances one theory will work in other circumstances another theory will, will work so um, and ultimately we find there's some uh, comparison between the two but anyway so I, I digress so we're here uh, and we're gonna take a little peek I want to start actually showing this kiddo do that, I'd like to set some context. and the context is uh, how to think about intelligence right so I I don't really agree with uh, this. I understand what they're what he's trying to say, and I think he's changed it a little to be able to uh, present it to non-academic people. But but really, we're talking about motor development and motor capacity, and and cognitive capacity. Okay, when he's when he's referring to athletic or cognitive intelligence, and as you know from the last slide, we said that. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, right? We need some level of, of central nervous system to act as a, a rate controller to allow us the capacity to be able to move, okay? Uh, not collide, go around. Uh, all those skills are a very tight connection between our bodies, our sensors, our brains, and uh, I've been calling that athletic intelligence. You know, most of us aren't real athletes, but we all uh, exhibit and rely on a great deal of athletic intelligence. The other kind of... In so here's the part uh, I wanted to For see. six months. And so now Julius, shown here on the left, is part of my, uh, my team. Uh, and we've been studying athletic intelligence at uh, sort of a refresher course in what athletic intelligence is like at two years old. Julius uh, is uh, two and two months now, but when he... So again, two months, we're kind of looking at this two-year-old, sorry, um, engage in different environments. And if you look at the adaptability, you can think of like ecological approaches and how some of this movement is, is it, it by necessity needs to be self-organizing to some degree. These are things this child has probably never done before, right? thinking or his body must be thinking about which set of hand and footholds will both propel him up the, the climb but also keep him stabilized as he goes. Here's a, an example in a, a less structured environment. It's really amazing to see this happen, uh, to get better and better every day. Uh, Here's what I call legipulation, Ooh. and you can see Julius is very proud of himself for having figured out that uh, he can impressive. pick up things with his feet, not just his hands. I don't know what kind of coordination goes on there. And here's a case where there's cognitive intelligence being combined with athletic intelligence. He's performing a task. I told him, I said, let's go stack up these sticks over there. Here's a manipulation task of inserting, and then a little dynamic knowledge. Okay, so again, new novel movement situations that this child needed to uh, coordinate. And again, I really feel that that tends to um, support a bit more of an ecological uh, perspective. And so now we'll look at some uh, robots that are essentially designed by Boston Dynamics and, and developed and definitely based off of... Um, uh, computing and some AI, but ultimately programming. 
and we'll we'll just kind of see the the parallels or or um, lack of here. If you haven't seen and some of these, they're controls. very impressive. So I am just going to um, touch on the controls and atlas, and I'll give full, you a reference picture of it, to so another yeah. video that uh, Scott Kuzner Kuzner made uh, recently. It really goes into lots of detail in how uh, Atlas works. Uh, but the basic approach we've been using for the athletic behavior I'm going to show in a moment is to build up a library of highly optimized behavior where we use. Um, so again, all he's saying there is they built up a library of different motor programs for this robot to be able to execute under different situations. So again, very similar to what the information processing theory would say. Then in real time to use vision to assess what the scene is, find footholds or handholds in some cases, I'm not going to show any handholds today, and then come up with a behavior. So again, right there, it just kind of said perceive. So visually see and then perceive that there's objects there and then execute the right plan. So that is kind of pulling in the perspective of information processing, right? So let me just show, this is, this kind of goes back a ways. This is, some of this stuff is, uh, um, goes back a, a couple of years. This might be one of the oh, most sorry. dynamic maneuvers we ever did. Better view. Hopefully there's very little there. vision being used here. This was all planned out in advance. A pretty um, impressive There's obviously stuff. control going on in order to stabilize uh, in the scenario. Uh, here's the first time we did uh, uh, gymnastics with rolling type behavior where we have contact not just with the feet but with the hands and uh, the body. Uh, that jump was done with uh, some of these optimization techniques. Here's another one that's very hard to perform uh, and the optimization is really paying off. And this was just done recently here. Vision is being used in real time to locate the boxes. Someone could actually go and move the boxes while the robot turns around and it would run back and see them. I'll show you a little bit about what the visualization of the vision system looks like when it does this. And here's a more complicated scenario where uh, the, the robot's running, uh, again, one-legged, but also has to deal with uh, a little bit of planning to deal with the, uh, the slope uh, incline of those plates. The white outlines show the robot's perception of a good support surface in these scenes. The green is the nominal foot path, and then those get adjusted uh, in response to the real-time assessment of what the robot's seeing and where the support points are. So yeah, pretty pretty interesting stuff, pretty wild. If you wanna go down a little bit of a semi-productive YouTube rabbit hole, um, I highly suggest you, you Google Boston Dynamic Robots and, and see what they're doing there. Okay. So again, that's just a number of different uh, theories that, that contribute to motor development and, and our understanding of um, and where we're at today. Okay. See you all, catch you next lecture.